And welcome back to the Federal Executive Forum on Federal News Network. We're talking about AI and ML, and I'm going to throw it over to you, Ron, at Department of Justice. Uh, what are you guys up to over there? What, what are you working on right now? Give us an example of a specific program that you're, you're working on. It's really uh, lighting it up there at Department of Justice. I think... Um... From, from the standpoint, you, you've heard some great use cases, and obviously within the department, we are exploring the use of AI in a number of tools, from tools that we're buying and what are the commercial impacts um, of using the AI, um, and what is also being used within our cybersecurity realm in these tools. I think you're, you're hearing a lot of good use cases. But one thing I, I wanted to add a little color on is uh, how accessible AI has become to our developers. So as a, as a personal example, just to sort of humanize this a little bit, I, my oldest son's at uh, Penn State University, and he's, he's an undergraduate, and he's doing computer vision. So I'm thinking back when I was doing my senior projects, I actually worked on neural nets, and um, I was trying to build out some algorithms, and that was 20 years ago. And here he is working on computer, computer vision. It fits on his laptop. He's, it's a couple hundred lines of dense Python code, and he's getting efficacy rates of better than 96%. Um, now the training, because it's on a laptop, it takes a little over four hours, but it's pretty astounding what is at the fingertips of our developers today. I think a lot of people today are, are looking at AI as something that is big and unapproachable, and this is something we have to be thinking about when the students and the developers that are, are, are driving a lot of our innovation really have it at their fingertips. Um, so I, I'll just leave it at, um, I, I really think we're spending a lot of time trying to make sure that people understand how accessible, what this really means um, really to the broad community. I mean, it is remarkable. The, the compute capability that's available to, to any uh, uh, college student, right? Any high school student. Uh, the data that's available, right, and uh, and the ability to 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 merge those things together is just unbelievable. With these new languages now, is is just fascinating what's happening there. All right, we're going to talk about priorities and uh, want to talk about top priorities for the coming year. And uh, Sanjay, let's start with you. Tell us uh, a lot of activity going on at SBA. You got a lot of things on the uh, on the deck right now. I'm sure you've got a lot of things uh, for. Uh, uh, top priorities that you're looking at? Sure. Um, so highest uh, level priority, obviously, is improving customer experience. Uh, that continues to be the SBA's focus and our focus at the uh, technologists, if you will, supporting SBA's mission. Uh, cybersecurity is number two. And uh, I know I won't go into a lot of details around that. I know some of my colleagues talked about it, about how AI and ML is enabling a more secure environment for us. Um, the one thing that I would say is uh, we are also looking at increasing the use of ML and AI for fraud detection, if you will. Um, that's something which when you're processing large volume of uh, applications, uh, that becomes, if you will, more um, available and handy in being able to do some automation there. Um, and I talked about how we are using AI and ML uh, in being able to process applications faster. So improving our customer response times, um, it, kind of the major recurring theme is around improving our customer experience. And we continue to do that, and we're looking for opportunities in that. The, the one last thing I'd say is that across the board, even within the three use cases I talked about, uh, and some of my colleagues here on the panel have mentioned that, um, some use cases, we had to spend an inc incredibly amount, amount of time in training the algorithms. Uh, for instance, uh, extraction of structured data from PDFs. But in the other use cases where AI ML is embedded, like the example of anomaly detection in the cybersecurity tools that I talked about earlier, that was a almost a just turn it on and start seeing the alerts that are coming on, fine tune it a bit, and you're ready to consume it. It's, and so, so we're seeing a broad spectrum across the board. Really cool. You, 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 I see work going on on the back end, work going on in the front end with the customer experience. That, that, that's fascinating. I'm really pleased to see that. Pam, how about over at uh, Department of Energy? Top priority for next year or this year? So the one of the top priorities is the workforce and talent management. So we've got to get the 
the workforce to the place where we uh, better understand how to test the AI and ML solutions that are either made available to us or those that we are building. So we need to better understand how to secure the data, for instance, that we're using to train the models with. How do we uh, uh, put together a good risk management program for uh, managing the assets in, as a whole, for instance, the models, the algorithms. Um, so we are very focused on that. And then I just want the, for my staff in particular, I really want us to, uh, we really embrace AI, we really embrace risk management, but we really need to get in there and better understand what that means and um, what is acceptable. What is an acceptable risk level, right? If, if I am um, looking to provide some insights uh, pertaining to my uh, pertaining to health, right? Is it acceptable that the 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 variance is one percent, right? Does it have to be a hundred percent precise? So we want to dig deeper into understanding that area of risk management and um, how to test and quality assure the products and services. And that is really uh, it, through my innovation community center that I have in, uh, in my office. Yeah. Um, that is something that we are really focused on is how do we go about this? Because that is the very next step, considering data, considering hypotheses, considering the fact that we are dependent on the AI outcomes. Uh, when I do a search, for instance, what's the, the probability that the search results are exactly what I need and how do I use the search results? So sure. it goes a little bit sure. deeper than uh, the surface type of stuff, but if I can get the workforce thinking about these things, yeah. we're ahead of the curve, but it's something that we absolutely uh, need and we're making that happen through, our, uh, through the Innovation Community Center. Fantastic. Glad to hear it. All right. So we're going to wrap it up here and we're going to ask all the panel members about uh, sort of what does the future look like? We're going to start with you, Alan, at Altrex. You know, what's it look like uh, going forward? What's it look like over the horizon? Yeah. So, you know, Ron mentioned his story about you know, someone with a, a technical background, his son learning, you know, vision systems in school and being able to do it lightning fast. And what we see now happening is this is spreading. You've got accountants basically now doing the same thing in their education program. And, and what we're really focused on is bringing these leading edge technologies of AI and ML to everyone. So in every area of the organization, at every level of the organization, people can go on this journey, whether it's the NLP sentiment analysis type stuff, being able to do it drag and drop or advanced modeling, um, really making it easy and guiding people along that journey. So many incredible use cases. Jim, how about over at Fortinet? So, Luke, it's easy to lose sight of the forest for the trees. We've been talking about a lot of really exciting tree-level things in AI and ML on this panel. Um, and from a cybersecurity perspective, it's, it, it's something that is going to fundamentally transform the way it's done. We're, going to, we're coming to a tipping point where we're going to take the advantage away from the offense, from the attacker, because they're not perfect. They're not invisible. And if finally AI and ML allows you to say, I see them trying, I see them failing, I can divine their intent. And while patient zero, to use the pandemic metaphor, is still battling an infection, I'm inoculating everybody else. That is transformational. And that's actually where AI and ML are driving us in the cybersecurity business. So my recommendation to a federal customer is there are only half a dozen of these big platform-based ecosystems out there. Pick one. Don't end up accidentally making procurements from three major ones because you're not getting defense in depth. You're leaving synergy on the cutting room floor. Pick one and drive it home. Good advice. Henry, how about at Cloudera? What's it look like uh, over the horizon for you all? Thanks, Luke. So I think just to, to say it quickly, um, you know, there was a survey done last year, only 35% of algorithm work was actually making it to production, right? The things that we think about are how do we productionize ML and AI? How do you do things like uh, where we're getting ML into everybody's hands, but we're also understanding how to secure it, how to govern it? Um, how, how do you know 
uh, where data came from, how it was changed, uh, and how is it going to be implemented in the past, right? So that we can actually put these things into production. And having a platform like Cloudera that allows you to do that full lifecycle from data collection all the way to ML um, and, and allowing it to make it into production more quickly. I think that's where the future is, is making these things, not science projects, but making them effective production use cases. Sort of real use, and we've heard some of that real use, sort of real time use cases that uh, are being uh, widely adopted, which is fantastic. Ron, what's the future look like? Uh, if we sort of, you know, sort of look over the horizon here in uh, the next two years, what can we expect across the Department of Justice? So I think, um, and I'm going to put on the, uh, my co-chair from the Innovation Committee that, that had from a federal wide, if you start thinking about how fast AI and ML is being adopted across the technology world, we really need to be thinking about um, a, a good understanding from a governance perspective, a broad understanding of what does it take to build, when you should be building AI versus buying AI versus understanding just understanding what you the controls you need to have in place of AI in your every, everyday products, and I think that if you if you flash forward a couple of years from now, we're going to have to make significant coordination and efforts to make sure that we have the right governance in place to ensure we have the controls, the cybersecurity, the privacy, um, and honestly, that AI aligns to American values when we have a human in the loop and eventually for when we don't have a human in the loop. And it's gonna take a lot, of, a lot of effort and coordination across the entire federal uh, ecosystem. Really is a, a delicate balance there, right? When you're looking at, uh, when you get to the point where, you know, or perhaps you don't need a human in the loop, so to speak, um, uh, uh, making sure that you're, you're doing that in a uh, thoughtful and respectful way is gonna be super important. Uh, Sanjay, how about over at SBA? Uh, what does it look like if I'm uh, if I'm going to go apply for a loan in two years? What kind of an experience am I going to have compared to what I have today? Which today is uh, awesome, excellent, by the way. So I don't know if it can get any better, right? I think it can definitely get better, Luke. Actually, mm -hmm. uh, reducing the time it takes to respond to our customer inquiries, whether it's loan applications, certification programs, or whatever services that we are providing to the citizens and the consumers. Certainly, this is where I see the use of AI and ML to help us reduce the time it takes us to service. So in essence, again, the recurring theme is improving customer experiences. Number two, I would say is improving our workforce from moving them into a more higher value added work uh, as opposed to the lower value added work that they are currently doing by automating things or using ML. And I talked about those examples like extracting data from, you know, structured data from, from PDF documents as an example. And number three, I would say, is improving our cybersecurity posture uh, by use of uh, AI and ML tools. So those are the three things I would say uh, I would see in the next two or three years for the SBA. Uh, and, and, and a much, uh, and, and all of those you're doing to some degree now. Uh, would exactly correct. In a, in a, in a more, uh, a more realized, more mature, more in depth way uh, over the next couple of years, which will, of course, you know, decrease the customer experience, et cetera. Pam, how about at Department of Energy, if we, uh, if we look at sort of uh, uh, yeah, the way you guys are operating in respect to uh, wildfires, which, you know, people might have not even have thought about that, right? It's a very interesting scenario you brought up or uh, the COVID stuff. I mean, what can we expect in a couple of years? I would say more of the collective impact partnerships. That's what we call it, um, consortium style um, activity where we're bringing groups of people together to collectively think about the solutions to problems. And then um, I want to say cognitive information agents. So when I model my business today, when I model my organization, and what's the most effective from an operations perspective, what should my business model look like? What are the core capabilities and competencies that I need? I don't want to have to do that. I want AI, I want to be able to run an algorithm or run a model and it tells me how my organization, what are the recommendations, how should my organization uh, be optimized, what are some of the operational models that we should consider. I don't really want to spend, I think about the financial services and, and uh, things like that and when I'm looking at my investments and my portfolio, I run tools that help me plan. I would rather see more AI built into how we run our business, 
how we drive customer experiences um, and things like that, rather than uh, me taking the time to do so and then bring in the human aspect of this to just validate what's going on and apply uh, proof of concepts, things like that. So that's what I'm looking at is for AI to give me more intelligence and how to run my organization more efficiently. Right, really extract yourself from some of that, that sort of daily grind and get into this higher order, sort of higher value, uh, similar to what Sanjay was saying, I, right. I think. Mm -hmm. Riley, how about over at the Air Force? A lot of activity going on over there. Uh, if we sort of looked over the horizon. I'm a new airman coming into the Air Force. What can I expect? Well, Luke, uh, you know, my belief is that the Air Force will continue our commitment to leverage our airmen and their innovation, basically to see and deliver on what the art of the possible, you know, actually is. Uh, we certainly, as Pan mentioned, will see these formalized connections to capabilities with seamless cross-service collaboration. And this will include with our allies, with our industry partners, with academia, and with the venture capital community. Um, uh, you know, having this advanced, I call it advanced situational awareness to the capabilities and capacities that are out there will only enable our Air Force investments in all the domains that we reside in today. Uh, fantastic. And I want to mention not only Air Men, but of course, Air Women who are out there uh, fighting the good fight. Um, uh, on behalf of all of us in protecting this nation. So I want to thank all of you, uh, first of all, uh, for taking your time out of your busy schedule today uh, to, uh, to participate on this panel. Uh, I'd like to thank the, uh, the sponsors for supporting us on this show. I'd like to thank the good people here at Federal News Network that make our program so successful and enjoyable. And most of all, I'd like to thank you, the listening audience, for tuning in every month. You've been listening to the Federal Executive Forum, part of the Federal News Network.